Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I, I've got to start, actually, by uh, saying thank you to the British Library Labs, to Mahendra and to Ben um, for the support they've given this project. Throughout this presentation, I'm going to be using words like, we created and we did this. That basically means Ben did something and I sort of sit around watching him do it. So um, I've got to say by saying that, that they deserve a great amount of credit for, um, for hopefully what I'm about to show you. Um, whenever I talk about this project on my research, I'm kind of um, duty bound to start with a bit of a warning because this presentation is going to contain some Victorian jokes. And, <laughs> and prolonged exposure to this kind of stuff can cause permanent damage to your sense of humour. So um, you have been warned, but please don't worry, it is, it is going to be okay. Um, throughout the course of this project and various other things I've been doing with this research, I have been sort of telling jokes in a very kind of odd way um, on the radio and at academic conferences, and obviously they're terrible. And it kind of creates this slightly odd atmosphere in the room where people are sort of thinking, should I laugh at this? What am I supposed to do? And there's a weird tension. So before we go anywhere, I kind of want to assure you you're under no obligation to laugh at this stuff. We'll just kind of get through it and it'll be fine. We'll take it very seriously. Um, but there is a point to kind of starting like this because... When we think of the Victorians, we do not associate them with humour at all, do we? They, they have a reputation, obviously, as being a very serious kind of people. I mean, you know, the most famous quote attributed to Queen Victoria is, of course, we are not amused. And that image of the Victorians as being essentially humourless, dour people has survived for a very, very long time. And I think it's a bit unfair, because actually when you start looking for humour in the Victorian period, when you start looking for jokes, you'll soon find that actually they're everywhere. They're in literature, they're in newspapers, they're in the music hall, they're in the conversations people have down the pub. Jokes, laughing, they are a major part of Victorian culture, and they're a part of Victorian culture that we've forgotten to a large extent, or that we tend to downplay. You know, we, we celebrate the great works of Victorian literature, the great works of Victorian art, but if I was to ask you, tell me your favourite Victorian joke, probably the vast majority of you would be sort of scrabbling around trying to figure out what that might be. So a while ago, I started investigating Victorian humour, particularly Victorian newspaper humour, and I discovered that actually it's a potentially a fascinating source for research. It tells us an enormous amount about, about power relationships in the 19th century, about who is laughing at who, where and when. And they reveal you know, an enormous amount of things like dialogue, slang, all sorts of things that aren't necessarily captured in sort of more forms of canonical Victorian culture. And so I've been working on this for a while. Um, I've published various articles on newspaper humour, um, on, particularly on newspaper joke columns. Um, this one at the bottom, the one, You Kick the Bucket, We Do the Rest, is an article where I track the journey of an individual joke from the moment it, it's written in New York as it sort of travels around America, gradually being sort of changed and altered with, by each sort of newspaper it passes into until it eventually you know, travels over to Britain and then ends up at a, a political meeting in North Wales. It's a kind of weird example of the kind of very sort of micro-history, I suppose, using digital archives. And so I have managed to be able to do this kind of research using conventional digital archives, the kind of things you might be familiar with, you know, the 19th century newspaper archive. And this was great. It did allow me to do new things. But I became increasingly frustrated that I was exploring jokes using an interface that was not designed to explore them. You know, it was designed to explore newspapers as a whole and all of the various kind of different genres and, and textual forms that appear within them. That actually, if I wanted to do slightly more advanced digital humanities work with jokes... I kind of realised that I needed to liberate them from these original archives and to, I suppose, transform them into a format that allowed us to do new things, that allowed us to interrogate these texts in interesting new ways. And so I suppose for a while I've wanted to do that. And when I saw the call for British Library Labs, I kind of thought, here's my chance, finally I'm going to get a chance to do this. So here's the idea that I initially pitched to the labs uh, six months ago. I kind of proposed that we would first find a way to extract jokes from newspapers, that would find some kind of way of pulling them out of these texts and bringing them into our own collection. Once we'd done that, the idea was that we would begin to mark these jokes up with additional descriptive metadata around things like characters, location, dialogue, you know, ways of adding data that isn't there in the newspaper archive. Um, once we'd done that, and this is where things got a little bit sort of weirder, I suppose, a bit more experimental, um, I proposed that we would then try and find a way to take that joke and map it onto an image from the British Library's digital collections. So it would search through until it found one that it thought fitted nicely. And at this point, and the joke and all of the additional data that we collected will be sort of superimposed on top of the joke at creating something new. This is where the meme machine comes in, which is the name of the project. So these are the initial sort of mock-ups I provided for the project. Um, so here we see there is a joke, and the joke reads, uh, a woman from Chicago says, how much do you charge for a divorce? The lawyer replies, $100, ma'am, or six for 500 
So the idea here is that, you know, there is a woman talking to a man, we know that much. Um, so we could easily just superimpose it onto an image like that. It kind of matches up. Um, but we could start doing slightly different things. Um, here we have the woman and the liar who are embroiled in something slightly different. Um, in this case, um, the liar is in a slightly more sticky situation with the wife's husband. Or who says we even need a liar at all? Um, actually, it could be something slightly different. So the idea here was that you can take a joke, you can then apply it to an image, and you can reinvent it. You can do different things with it. The idea then is that these would be sent out over social media, and we would kind of try and find a way to take this kind of fossilized Victorian comedy and then reintroduce it into the bloodstream of, of modern comedy culture by creating these kind of visual versions of it that we can send out over Twitter, Tumblr, whatever social media uh, you might like. So that's the idea I pitched. Essentially, we would find a way to liberate jokes from the archives and then transform them into something new to get them out to new audiences. And that's what we've been working on for the last few months. Um, so I'm going to talk you through the kind of different stages of this project. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, an idea I kind of had as I was just kind of um, eating breakfast one day, and it was a kind of, seemed to me to be fairly simple. What we've kind of discovered and what, you know, what has now become obvious is that there are a lot of stages involved in a, uh, in a project like this that all have their own complications. So the first thing, obviously, we had to do was try and figure out, well, where do we find jokes? Where do we go in the library's digital collections to uncover this content? And there are all sorts of places, as I've said, where the Victorians told jokes, places where they've been printed. But the two best sources by far are books and newspapers. That's where you can find concentrations of them and where you can find them in large numbers. The, kind of the, the, the number I have in mind for this project when we finish is to get somewhere near a million Victorian jokes. So we knew we had to find quite a few. Um, so we did start with looking at books. Uh, and there are books in the library's digital collections that are essentially Victorian joke books that are just packed with them. Uh, here's the one that we've used for our sample. It's called The Book of Humour, Wit and Wisdom, A Manual of Table Talk. You know, it's designed to give people anecdotes to tell down the pub, basically. Um, and in terms of finding jokes within this, well, it's very easy. If we just flick through a few pages, um, you'll start to see that it is essentially just a book entirely filled with jokes that are very easily kind of, of separated out with titles, uh, and, you know, they're very sort of clearly demarcated jokes. Now, I'm sure that there is going to be a way that we can automatically, you know, read a text like this and pull jokes out and potentially do it for other books. Because we were kind of wanting to do a, a lot of things in a very limited amount of time, um, we manually extracted them. I say we, and Wendy, one of our volunteers, went through and, and extracted the jokes into a spreadsheet. Um, so I'm very grateful to the work she did for that as well. Um, so that was one of the sources. Now, while we can get a few, we get about 700 jokes from this one book, there aren't as many jokes in the books as there are in newspapers, and, and newspapers are where my expertise lies. So we've also been looking very much at newspaper joke columns. Now, this is one of the, the great sort of things in Victorian newspapers. We know that they contain politics and, and sort of economics and all that kind of stuff. They're packed with all sorts of other unusual content. And it turns out that for the last maybe 30, 40 years of the 19th century, a lot of the most popular weekly papers in the country would print a regular weekly installment of jokes. And this will be a column of 20 or 30 gags, usually that they've stolen from other newspapers or from Punch. It's an extraordinary culture of piracy at work, at work in this period. And the great thing here is that actually, when you start to do the numbers on that, if you have 20 jokes in a column, and that column runs every week for 30 years, we're suddenly looking at tens of thousands of jokes from one newspaper, all coming in these little packages. Uh, the one I've got here shows them. These are all joke columns that came from the Hampshire Telegraph. Uh, these are imported American jokes that they clipped from American papers, and um, all sorts of variety of peculiar titles. This is a sort of an unusual example in that every week they would change the title of their column, which is really frustrating from a research <laughs> point of view. Um, but a lot of others would have, you know, jokes of the day, you know, and it would be that column title every week. Now, that makes it potentially quite easy to find them, because we know that it, once we've found that title, we can extract all the columns uh, with that name. So this is an example of the XML metadata. This is actually behind the Daily Mail archive. Um, so not the ones we've been using, but it's a similar kind of structure. And you can see there's all the metadata there. But there is this field here called title. So these newspaper archives have been broken down to an article level. You know, we're not having to kind of separate jokes out from an entire page of information. You know, they are there, and they work at this kind of level. So I'm hopeful that we're going to find a way to extract jokes and sort of joke columns from these newspapers um, you know, automatically and en masse. Again, we kind of ran into some slight difficulties here with this extraction process because you can't do that certainly using the conventional archive. These are co commercial interfaces that are built around keywords, that are built around you know, finding an individual article and then maybe downloading it. And it was a little tricky for us to get access to the raw data at the library in the format that, that, that um, we could use. Um, we are planning on finding ways to do this. It was, again, just figuring out we wanted to push on with the project. So I selected and manually downloaded um, a year's worth of joke columns from Lloyd's Weekly News that we're going to use as our sample. 
But I think you know, we've learned enough about the data to know that, that we can automatically extract this stuff, um, hopefully, as the project develops. So even if we were automatically extracting it, if we were managing to grab you know, a thousand joke columns plus the OCR data and all that kind of stuff, we still run into a slight problem, and that's that, of course, the OCR quality is mixed. Um, now, for a, a major newspaper archive, having mixed quality OCR is kind of okay. You know, they, they can work on whatever it is, an 80% success rate or less. Because we want to republish the jokes, because we want to really sort of create a high quality um, database of them, we need a much better uh, OCR. And this is a good example of a joke that we see on the left um, where uh, Mrs. Talbot says, I see by the paper, May, that Mrs. Foley is dangerously ill but insists upon having two wings added to her house before she dies. Her daughter replies, good idea, Ma, judging from all reports, they're the only pair she will ever have. Um, and you can kind of see that that's been garbled by the OCR on the side. It's kind of enough if you were searching for this digitally, you might find it. But if we're going to try and reprint this, it's not good enough. So we knew, I think, pretty early on that we would have to have people correcting OCR and doing this manually. Um, there's a limit to what you can do automatically with this kind of stuff. So we've set up a kind of a process of, trans of transcribing joke columns. Um, and we've done this using Omika, uh, you know, the, uh, the kind of publishing platform that's designed for digital archives. Um, and what we've done is sort of divided our columns up into three sections, um, as you can see here, ones that are awaiting transcription, some that are in progress, and some that have been completed. And I've got a team of students at my university working on this um, for free, which is um, <laughs> kind of the, the um, privileges of being a teacher and, and, and trying to sort of force them to do it, I guess. Um, so this is the platform we've got. Um, we've got a, a plugin called Scripto, which works as part of Omika, where you can see at the top there you have the, the original scan of the article, and below we have a transcription. Um, so we have people kind of working from that, that, that transcription, then typing the jokes up. Um, hopefully when we get access to the OCR, we'll be able to kind of bring the damaged OCR in and then they'll just correct it. But even when we tested that, we found that people actually found it quicker to type up fresh text than pick through broken OCR. So actually, in some respects, it's better just to start with a clean slate. In the process, they're also marking these jokes up. So here I have another joke um, with the title over on business where a man named Jones says, I always make a point of telling my wife everything that happens. His friend replies, my dear fellow, I tell my wife lots of things that never happen. Now, this one's been a kind of reasonable joke. This one's got all the features of, of the jokes that you will see in these columns. So it has a title, it has the main section of the joke, and then it has the attribution. Now, this means that it's been clipped or stolen from a, a magazine called Ariel. So when our transcribers are doing this, they recognize these features of the joke. So each joke is, is encased within the kind of J tag, because they're going to be transcribing 30 at once. There's then a title tag for the title and, a, and an attribution tag for the attribution. What that basically means is that once we've done that, we're no longer reliant on the original scan. We can kind of now say, right, we're done with that now. We've got all the key data that we needed from it, so we don't have to republish that. What we wanted to do as well was then actually add additional data. So we're, we're working on this still, but trying to figure out the kind of other metadata that we can add, uh, or that users might add. In this case, name, uh, dialogue, things that you know, will be useful for people searching, that will be useful for, say, well, let's say, I don't know, if you're working in linguistics and you want to identify passages of dialogue rather than description, um, this will be quite a useful tool to isolate that, I think. Um, so users have been doing that. Um, and again, we've got a, sort of a small team of students working on this, and, and they've sort of found this um, you know, a, a, you know, fairly straightforward way of doing it. As the project develops, you know, I would like to try and do this in a way using slightly sort of smoother interfaces, things that are a bit more user-friendly than just entering text into a window. But for now, it's, as a proof of concept, uh, it's working fine. So... Once we've done that, so at this stage what we've managed to do is we've extracted jokes from an existing digital archive, we've imported them into our transcription system, we've transcribed the jokes, we've tagged them, we've marked them up. At this point they're ready for republishing. So the examples I showed you earlier were these ones that I really wanted to do using speech bubbles. And I like these, I think that they're, you know, they're kind of a visually compelling way of doing it. In terms of finding a way to automatically do this though, it, it is clearly very difficult. You know, mapping these bubbles onto faces, making sure they're pointing in the right places, making sure the text isn't too long. I think we're still going to work up to this and potentially have this as, as a possibility. But for now, we've been sort of trying to find a way to take our jokes and publish them in ways that are a little more straightforward. So I've got some examples here of sort of mock-ups that are pretty close to what we're doing at the moment. Um, here we have one um, with our mechanical comedian, who I'll tell you about in a minute, who's a kind of Victorian automaton who's going to tell jokes. And you can kind of see that, that we've got the kind of the metadata at the bottom, we have the joke at the top, um, and then we have a kind of image at the right-hand side. Uh, this image could be um, a whole range of things. So um, in this case, I've got this rather devilish-looking chap that we, um, we collected from a, a, a music hall program. These images, I should say, are all coming from the British Library's Flickr One Million. So 
One of the things I'm going to talk about in a minute, I suppose, is, is remixing of collections. The idea here is that we take the jokes and we match them with images that have already, that, you know, the library already has. So we're reusing them in new ways too. Um, we also have these great comic illustrations from the Flickr One Million as well, which kind of, um, you know, um, are, are great for interactions and dialogue. Um, basically, I'm always on the lookout for an image that is usable with a terrible joke, because that is the vast majority of our material. So having somebody who looks utterly um, despondent at, at the state of the joke is, is, is probably the easiest way to kind of make it funny again, I think. Um, so this is the kind of stuff that we're, we're currently putting out. Um, but of course, we could just pick any old Victorian and face and kind of just have them as the joke teller. Um, it's an interesting kind of moment, and when we get to a point where we have loads and loads of these images together, the sort of random pairings, I think, are going to create some new sources of comedy. Um, so the idea here is to get, you know, whatever it is, a few thousand images there that it could be drawn upon, and then occasionally those odd juxtapositions are going to hopefully um, reinvent the joke slightly. So these are the formats we're doing, and, and this is completely automated. You know, this is, um, or, you know, the, the image at the, the moment I've added, but that is, is near enough automated. So we have a, a stage now where pretty much all of the jokes we've transcribed, and we've got about one and a half thousand at the moment as a kind of working sample, that they can be immediately transformed into this format you know, um, at once, all at once. So that's, that's now automated. Um, we do have other possibilities. Um, particularly for dialogue-based jokes, I'm really interested in finding ways to represent conversations in slightly more interesting ways. Um, with this one on the right as well, I, I also like the idea of using images as sort of as almost like a part of the storyboard. So you have the joke going on, and then the image is a kind of reaction joke. So here, you know, where we've got um, the wife saying, that dog of Smith's across the way, bit mother again this morning, and I want to know what you intend to do about it. The husband replies, I think I shall buy that dog. Um, and then we have the image as the reaction, the wife throwing, well, actually, the description was acid in his face, which is quite a sort of an overreaction. But um, again, we're kind of finding interesting ways to take different parts of digital content. And that's from um, the Illustrated Police News, which is part of the, you know, the British Library um, newspaper archive. And we're finding ways to kind of remix that with the jokes and hopefully kind of bring them back to life. So we're working on these formats, and, and as we kind of learn more about the jokes, as we learn more about the technology that lets us do this, I think the formats are going to get increasingly more sophisticated and more interesting. Um, so what happens with these then? Well, what happens is that they will then be published by our mechanical comedian, who you can see at the top here. He's the kind of wayward brother of the mechanical curator. So instead of kind of tweeting out things from the, um, the, the, uh, the British Library sort of... Um, uh, you know, archives, this is going to tweet out jokes. So every hour, pro or, sorry, every lunchtime, I think we're going to do it at the moment, a new joke will be kind of put forth over Tumblr and Twitter uh, by the mechanical comedian. Um, he hasn't started yet, but I imagine in the next week he is going to suddenly start putting out material. So um, keep your eyes on this. So victorianhumor.tumblr.com is a good place to look out for that. Um, there are some samples up there already if you want to have a quick look. And you can also follow us on at Victorian Humour. It is very silent at the moment. You know, he hasn't yet spoken, but he's building up and working up to it and just keeping you waiting a little longer. But very soon, that, that's going to start sending stuff out. I think what's potentially quite um, interesting and exciting about this, of course, is that at the moment, we're just going to be sending out random jokes. But we could start to find ways to, well, let's say, link jokes together. So the mechanical curator you know, um, tries to find patterns and kind of ways of linking things together in, in, in its output. With us, we could have you know, each joke links in some way to the previous one. Uh, another possibility might even be to try and find a way to do topical comedy by looking for what words are trending on Twitter and then finding jokes that have them in, um, which could end up with some quite interesting outputs too. The idea is then that we, we track how people use these things. Are they retweeting them? Are they then sort of doing their own versions? Um, and I suppose what we're trying to do is, is, is examine a mirror image of that um, 19th century culture of reprinting that I'm really interested in for my own research, yeah, and kind of compare it to a 21st century culture of retweeting and kind of see how those sort of things uh, work together. So in addition to these outputs, we do have a kind of database um, page, which is going to be at victorianhumor.com. Again, this is still very kind of early stages with this stuff, and, you know, it, it's not kind of in a state yet where we're kind of ready to say, you know, hey, every, world, come and look at this, this great thing we've finished. But you can start to see um, how it works here. So the idea is, as, you know, as the project develops, we will have a, a very sort of serious research archive of jokes that scholars can come and use, as well as this kind of mechanical outputting that um, we'll send them out over social media. So that's what we've done so far. And, and you know, we have sort of, I think over the last few months, managed to make great headway on most of these steps and figuring out how a lot of these things are going to work and what we're going to do next. So next, yes, the automatic joke publishing will start very, very soon. Um, and at that point, you know, if you can retweet stuff, that would be great. Just to kind of get things off the ground, I'd be very, very grateful. Um, what we're also going to do is start inviting users to reinterpret jokes. 
around a kind of make this funny competition, I suppose. So maybe every week, every month, I'm going to put maybe two or three of the worst possible jokes I can find and say to the internet, please help us, do something with this, make these funny again. Um, so right now I've got um, a guy named Rob Walker who is the director of a web series called The Victorian Cutout Theatre, which is this really bizarre kind of comic uh, uh, video series where he takes um, Victorian illustrations and animates them. And I've given him a bundle of the jokes, and he's at the moment trying to find a way to make them funny again. So we're going to put that out soon. And then, yeah, basically invite the internet to see what they can do with it and see what kind of things uh, um, they can make of it. Um, who knows what they might do. So once that's done, I mean, that, that will be the end of the kind of, if you like, the lab stage of the project, the, the project that um, you know, we kind of pitched for this, this sort of initial um, stages. But I'm really keen to take what we've learned here and then expand it into a much bigger project to you know, aim at our one million jokes and to produce a serious research archive. So over the course of the next few months, I suppose I'm looking um, at external funding, trying to find um, the right kind of scheme to apply for, and also to try and find some external partners uh, who will be interested in building this with me. So if you fancy doing it, or if you know anybody who um, has a high tolerance for terrible jokes and wants to help me build um, some pretty cool tools, um, then by all means, um, get in touch. I'd love to hear from you. Um, or a radio yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Um, so as part of the next one, once we get that funding, once somebody kind of says, yes, this is, this is worth giving you some money to do, um, the idea is to expand and automate that extraction of jokes, to find a way to pull the content from digital archives automatically and at a large scale. Um, the idea is we probably will implement a new transcription platform. Um, Scripto that we have now has worked really well. I mean, the, the tools that we've used for this, I should say, are all open source, freely available tools that Ben has kind of expertly stitched together. I think it's a good example of how you can kind of get a project off the ground and start to experiment without building a bespoke thing right from the start and having you know, thousands upon thousands of pounds of money and developers working on it. But I would like to do something that we can have you know, the general public just transcribing, not a, a team of 10 people. Um, something, I suppose, that's akin to the um, Transcribe Bentham project or the um, Dickens Journals Online. I'd like to then develop that into an accessible research archive of Victorian jokes. Kind of in my fantasies, I'm imagining a kind of um, a Victorian joke version of the Old Bailey Archive, of a really great kind of search interface where you can go in and look at all these things. And I also want to continue experimenting with ways to publish and reinvent these jokes. So I'm quite keen to give them to a stand-up comedian and see if um, they will, um, they'll have a go with them, see what they can do with them. The couple that I've approached have been very wary about it, as you might understand. Um, getting people to record sketches, whatever, whatever they might do to try and reinvent these things, I think there are lots of ways we could explore this. So that's what we're working on. So this is, you know, I admit, an unusual project. But, and I hope, you know, I think potentially having an access, you know, a corpus of a million jokes that's very portable, that's usable for all, in all sorts of different projects, will be useful to historians, to literary critics, to linguists, or to novelists even who just want to kind of explore the period. There are, I think there potentially is a real audience for that. But there is a bigger picture at work here that I think is worth kind of reflecting on, um, and I suppose it's things that we've been trying to do that I hope will apply to other projects too. And the first centers on this idea of repurposing data. Because over the last 10, 15 years, we have digitized an enormous amount of stuff. You know, but we've tended to digitize it for a very specific purpose and then keep it locked into that purpose. You know, we design a particular interface, a particular archive around a particular idea, and then it stays in that format. And as a result, data often isn't used in the most interesting or creative ways. Newspapers are a great example of that. You know, we've digitized millions upon millions of pages, but we search all of them in the same way, using the same basic keyword interface. But newspapers, have, you know, they've got joke columns, they've got serialized fiction in there, they've got fashion columns, recipes, sports reports. Every single one of those genres could be interpreted in different ways, could be you know, subjected to different kinds of tools. And I think one of the most exciting and promising areas of the digital humanities now is actually saying, let's take the data that we've got that was produced for one purpose and let's do something else with it. Let's see if we can pull out a fraction, an element of that data and reinterpret it, repurpose it, use it for new things. And in the process, I suppose the other thing that I'm really interested in is this idea of remixing, of taking two different sets of data, whether it's bits of a newspaper, images from books, um, or it could be you know, weather reports from a database, whatever it might be, and taking those separate data sets that were never designed to speak to one another and combining them in new and interesting ways. And I think, again, this is potentially a really exciting area of the digital humanities, something that allows us to create new connections and reuse content in interesting ways. I'm also finally very interested in, I suppose, what we might term the gamification of, 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 of digitization. Um, what I sort of envisage for this project in the end is, is something that could be done on, let's say, an iPhone app where you get sent a joke, you transcribe it, you tag it, you do all those kind of little things, and at the end of it, you're, re you're rewarded with the meme, with the image. And there is that kind of creative process involved in it. But at the time, you know, that somebody who's doing that 
isn't just getting the image at the end, they're improving our data. And so that's what I'm really interested in, is finding ways to, I suppose, do crowdsourcing in creative new ways. That isn't just get people to sit in front of a transcription and type, but play with stuff, you know, make things in, you know, that are interesting, that more people want to see, and in the process, improve our data. Um, so there are all sorts of things that we're looking at with this. There is the kind of image creation side of things. We may even sort of look at doing things like joke treasure hunts using the British newspaper archive where we get people looking for stuff and seeing how many they can find, you know, and introduce a sort of slightly competitive element to it. So I think there are potentially some interesting things to, dis, you know, to explore here in terms of how do we mobilise people to help us create digital archives, you know, beyond just the, the fact of saying this is a good thing, please help us. And so finally, I think this is a good opportunity just to reflect. I think this is what the labs is doing really well. What it's allowed me to do is to bring an idea that was just something that I thought of and I had no idea what to do with next, and to start experimenting with all of these things. Um, and you know, they've pr you know, provided a great environment for me to start doing that, and I'm really excited to see what kind of things um, they're going to end up doing next. This whole idea of opening up data, of repurposing it, of remixing it, of thinking about new ways to use it is fantastic, and I'm just so pleased that the British Library is doing this now, and I think the labs are doing terrific work with that. So. Um, I'll finish off then just by saying that if you want to keep an eye on this project, there are the, um, the links I showed you earlier, victorianhumor.tumblr or at victorianhumor. I'll also be blogging about it at my research blog, which is digitalvictorianist.com, um, or you can get me on Twitter at digivictorian. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you who want to get involved with it. I think you know, we could have quite a lot of fun with it. And I should say that, that in terms of potential involvements, once we have the data um, gathered together, the jokes, I'm happy for anybody to do whatever they want with that. You know, if they want just a dump of the data to start interpreting and using their own tools, great. You know, I think we should be as open and, and, as, and as sort of collaborative as possible on this. So uh, thanks very much.